We've been looking at a series called Seeing Jesus as He Saw Himself and looking in particular at the verses where Jesus said, I am, I am. I don't know uh, if you remember about the two preachers. The one was actually a Catholic priest and a Baptist preacher, their side of the road, and they had their signs out. And the signs said, repent, the end is near. Car had come by, and they'd mock the preachers, come on, the end is near, and they'd keep on going. Some of them, you know, they gave them the Italian salute, and some stuck their tongues out at them. And, and uh, they would go by, and as they'd go by, it wouldn't be long, they'd hear the screeching of tires and a big kind of crash. And uh, they put the signs out even more emphatically. Repent, the end is near. Cars would go by, screeching tires. And finally, the, the Baptist preacher says to the Catholic priest, well, well maybe we should change our signs to, re- to, to read, turn around, bridge out ahead. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, Proverbs 16, both chapters have that same statement. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jesus said, and that's what we're going to look at today, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are many ways that lead to destruction. That's what Proverbs chapter 14, 16 says. But there's only one way that leads to life. And Jesus, even in a previous sermon, said there's a wide road and a wide gate that leads to destruction, and many people are on it. And then there's a narrow, there's a narrow way, and there's a narrow gate, and there's few that are on it. Today, Jesus says, listen, I am am the way. I want to focus on that. These three come as heart fast paced. I am the way. I am the the truth. I am the life. And we're going to hit all three of those because Jesus saw himself as the way. I want to ask you, have you ever been lost? Yeah? Ever been lost? Yeah, I think everybody said I've been lost. Hey, I mean really lost. So you uh, really didn't even know where you're going. I mean, you say, oh my goodness, I am like totally, totally confused here. How about you were lost, and you didn't know it. I can remember as kids. Uh, and we always traveled for our summer vacation down to Missouri to see my grandparents. And uh, when we were kids, and we were loud and rowdy, the idea of my dad was get up really early. He'd go to bed early, wake up, keep us up at normal hours, and, and then we would he'd get up early like 2 in the morning, throw us in the car, and then we would sleep. See, that way he could do the 11-hour trip because there were no super highways back then, and he could do that 11-hour trip with the kids sleeping in the car. And I can remember, you know, we should be halfway there, and I can remember waking up because it's getting daylight out now. So we've been on the road like six hours or so, and uh, we drive for a little longer, and all of a sudden we said, Dad, how much longer? And he said, oh, we should be getting there soon, and we looked, and we saw in front of us a sign that said, Welcome to Michigan. He was lost and didn't even know it. We still had like nine hours to go. He totally defeated the purpose of getting us all all up, you know, early in the middle of the night and driving for that, because he was lost and didn't know it. I think that's the way most people are. They are lost and they don't even know it. They're on that broad road, and there's a lot of people on it, and they're doing everything everybody else is doing, and hey, we're having a great time, wonderful time, and they don't know that the bridge is out up ahead, and they're ignoring the signs that say, repent, turn around, because there's a destruction ahead. And they're missing the narrow road and the road to be on it that leads to life we got to pick up in the previous chapter and get a little background for what Jesus is saying, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the chapter 13, you've got to realize it's Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday, okay, is the day before Good Friday. On Monday, Thursday, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet, you know, in the upper room, and he's been talking to them. And we get towards the end of the chapter of Monday, Thursday. He says, my little children, or my children, I will be with you only a little longer. Now, when we read back in time, we know that a little longer is just a few hours. Just a few hours. 
Judas is going to betray him with a kiss, and he's going to be taken from the disciples, and they're not going to see him for a while. He said, my little children, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I am telling you, where I am going, you cannot come. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Where is he going? He's going to the cross. Where is he going? He's going to the grave. Where is he going? He's going to the resurrection. Where is he going? To the ascension. Where is he going? He's going back to the Father. He's going to heaven. And what is he saying? Listen, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now, you've got to love Peter. Peter is a guy that always speaks up, and speaks his mind when everybody else is thinking it. He says it. And so he says, Simon Peter asked him, uh, Lord, where are you going? This is a good question. Where are you going? We know that looking back where he's going. He doesn't know it because he's still looking future. Where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow me. Not now, but you will follow later. And Peter, you know Peter, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. You know where this is going, don't you? If you read the gospel all, you know where this is going. Jesus then answered him, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. We've got to be very careful we don't become arrogant in our faith. We've got to be very careful because him who thinks that he stands is about to fall. Okay, So we live a humble Christian life, not an arrogant proud. Wow, look at me. I'm a follower of Jesus. Sorry about you, buddy. No, it's a humble thing that God has graced me. He was asking, where are you going? And Jesus says, hey, well, well, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust me. You know what he's saying? I know where I'm going. Just trust me. Just trust me. I know where I'm going. In fact, he says, I know where I'm going, and I know the way to get there. Later, he says, I am the way. But right now, he says, this is where I'm going. In my Father's house are many rooms. I like the King James Version, although it's not as accurate as this. In my Father's house are many mansions. I like that word mansions because i got to believe that's going to be one terrific place. I already put my order in. I want it at the corner of Glory Avenue and Hallelujah Street. You look me up when you get to heaven, that's where I'm, I'm hoping to be. All right, Glory Avenue and Hallelujah Street. Yeah. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Here it is. He's answering Peter's question. I am going there. Remember Peter said, well, where are you going? He said, I am going to heaven. You can't come right now. You're not coming now. You're going to come later, later. I'm going there, and he says, to prepare a place for you. My goodness, he's been gone for 2,000 years, right? And he's making preparation for me. He's making preparation for you. I have this idea from other passages of Scripture, like in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, that the city is already there, and so it's already been created, but Jesus is making the preparations just for me and you. He's getting the room ready. At our house, anytime we are having company, my wife says, well, we got to clean the house, and that means, oh my goodness, we do everything. We vacuum, we dust, I mean, we, we put out the best of everything, we make the house. Jesus is preparing a place for me, for you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Listen, this is the first reference, I believe, in the Bible to the word, the term, the concept of the rapture. Every other passage in the Old Testament, when he returns, he returns and sets up a kingdom. But here's what he says. He says, I'm going to come back and take you out of this world to go back to heaven and be with me. Isn't that amazing? He's saying this to the disciples, the believers. The disciples become the church, and the church is going to be raptured out of this world. In fact, that is the next prophetic event on God's calendar, is that the church is raptured, 
And then after the, they've been in heaven and there's been a terrible time of tribulation on earth, then the church will come back with him when he actually comes down to set up the kingdom and we too will be in the kingdom. Isn't this great? Right here he's saying, listen, I go and I'm preparing a place for you and I'm going to come back to take you up with me so that you may be where I am in heaven. Then he says this. All of that to get to this. He says, you know the way to the place where I am going. You've got to love Thomas too. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. Duh, I just told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. But, you know, sometimes we just don't get it, you know? How many of you have ever read the Bible and the second time you read the passage you said, whoa, I don't think I saw that before. Well, yes, you did. You read it before, but whoa, it, now it strikes you. It's like that for everybody. It's even for me. I've read through my Bible several times and, whoa, I can't believe that there. I must have missed that. Listen, he didn't connect the dots. He says, we don't know where you are going. He just told them where he was going. So he said, how can we know the way? He said, I'm lost. I'm lost. I don't even know that I'm lost because I, my goodness, I'm so lost, I don't know where I'm going. That's pretty lost. He says, yeah, I am lost. I don't know where I'm going. How can I know the way when I don't know where I'm going? And Jesus said, I am the way. Podas is the Greek word. Road, path the trail that you follow. We saw just last week, Jesus said, I am the door. You open the door, you enter, then there's the path. You follow the path. The door is into the fold of God's salvation. You're on this path. You are following Jesus. We are followers of the way. It all begins with faith, because Jesus said this as he began the passage. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God trust also in me. The word trust is the Old Testament word used often for the idea of what we call faith, belief. I trust to someone. So imagine I have a chair up here, okay? And I got a chair, and I look at that chair and say, oh, it looks like a pretty sturdy chair. And uh, so I, I can say, hey, that looks like a chair. That's it, it. But when I actually go over and actually sit on it. See, I could say, I think that chair will hold me up. I think, in my mind, okay, it's all, all in my head. And uh, I can go over and check it out, push it around. Yeah, that's pretty solid. But it's not holding me up until I actually sit on it. And once I sit on it and lift my feet, no, I'm not going to do that because there's no chair here, okay? When I lift my feet up, I am trusting I'm believing more than with just my head. I'm believing with my heart, with a whole commitment. I'm trusting in the chair. When Jesus says, trust in me, he's saying, let go of everything else. Pick up your feet. Just recline and trust in me. The work that I have done on the cross to die for your sins, paid in full. Don't try to do it on your own. Don't go on the wrong path. Go through me. I am the way. Trust me. Trust me. Now, it's very interesting to me. And Jesus said, I am the way. you got to trust me. It's a way of faith. Before they were called Christians, the disciples were called those who belong to the way. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? They were the way people. Why? They had put their commitment and trust that Jesus is the only way to the Father in heaven. He is it. And so they got dubbed this title. They're the way people. People of the way. In fact, it goes in the book of Acts all the way towards the end. The apostle Paul is defending himself in a court, and he says, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. If you're lost, and I don't care how, how, what, what you're lost at, Jesus is your way. You can be lost in philosophy, Jesus is the way. You can be lost in your emotions, Jesus is the way. You can be lost at work, Jesus is the way. You can be lost in your family, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way, he says, ultimately, Jesus is the way to the Father. There is no other way. 
There is no other way. He goes on and he says, and Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Ever been deceived? Tricked? Okay, come on. How many have ever seen a magician? They're really good at it. They can really pull that off. Let me ask, have you ever embraced a lie? Truth is, I think we all have. Here's how we do it. Man, I can't do anything right. Did you ever say that? Ever slip out of your mouth? All right. Nobody likes me. Man, I have no friends. I am just so stupid. Why didn't I see that? What, 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 all, all these things. We have embraced a lie that we don't measure up to some standard. Somebody else's standard, maybe there's a child says, what's wrong with you? You can't do anything right. So you grew up and you thought in your mind, I can't do anything right. So I embraced a lie that somebody else gave to me, and it's not the truth at all. I'm living in a lie because I've embraced the lie. Sometimes we tell ourselves that. We look in the mirror and we see ourselves and say, Ben, how could anybody love me? We tell ourselves a lie. God tells us that we are made in his image, and if no one else loves us on this planet, God loves you, and God loves me. God has assigned a purpose to my life. When I say, oh, I can't do anything right, that's a lie. There's something I can do right because God has prepared and made me in his image to do something right. And I just embrace the lie. We, we, We do this all the time. Jesus said, listen, he is the truth. If you want to get out of embracing the lies, you have got to come to the truth. If you want to stop being deceived, you have to come to the truth. And Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the truth. In 1 John, the apostle writes this, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. You want to know the truth? You've got to know Jesus Christ. You've got to. And we are in him. We are believers in him. We have been united to him So in our faith, so we are in him who is true. I have truth in me, folks. Because the Son of God dwells in my heart by faith. There's truth in me. And we are in him who is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ, And he is the true God. He is true God. God invaded me when I was eight years old. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. God the Son dwelled in my heart by faith. God the Holy Spirit made my body his temple. God invaded me, and he is the truth. I have to discover and uncover the truth within me to push out the lies that Satan, because he's the father of all lies, and that he is wanting me to buy into, and I have to push them out and tell them. Yeah, I got to sometimes, like Jesus said, Satan, get thee behind me. I have to tell them, get these lies out of my life. I am a valuable, worthwhile human being that God loves so much that he sent his son on the cross to die for me. I'm valuable, I'm valuable in God's sight. God is, he, Jesus is true God, he is God in the flesh. So that in John in chapter 1, verse 14, when he calls him the Word, the Word is the title of Jesus before he was born. He was called the Word. It's capitalized there, the Word, because it's a name. He says, the Word became flesh. That's Christmas. He dwelt among us. That's his life. We have seen his glory. That's what he's doing, all the miracles and things that he was doing in his lifetime. The glory of the one and only, that's the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. You want to have truth in your life? You have to have Jesus Christ in your life. For the law was given through Moses. The law curses and condemns, but grace, the free gift of God, eternal life, and truth, truth comes through Jesus Christ. You have to have a relationship with him. You see, this truth concept permeates everything. I go to the grocery store and I find two apples 
I'm going to buy these apples. They look good. I'll have them for lunchtime today. So I take him to the counter, and right next to me there was another guy. He doesn't believe in Jesus, and he takes his two apples, and uh, he puts them on the counter, and there's a big difference between my two apples and his two apples because my two apples, from my perspective, are two God-created apples. That's the truth. His two apples, from his perspective, he doesn't have the truth. His two apples are two evolved apples that just happened out of a big bang that came from nowhere. We got two different kinds of apples. Now, they taste the same. They look the same. But I have the truth, and he's living in a lie. And the person who doesn't have Jesus Christ, everything in their life is a lie because they don't know where it came from, where it is going, who made it, who owns it. They have no purpose, no direction, no clarity. Everything is just chance. Now, just think about it. Chance is nothing. Chance is a nothing. When they say things just happen by chance, it means by nothing. We see everything so differently. When I came to Christ, I developed a biblical worldview so that I see everything, everything through the eyes of the Jesus Christ as being the truth. Politics, I see it through the eyes of the truth. I believe that there's a biblical doctrine of politics. There's a biblical doctrine of the church. There's a biblical doctrine for, for being a man. There's a biblical doctrine for being a woman. And all of this, this is the truth. Over here on the other side, they're so confused, they don't know if they're a man or a woman. <laughs> they can't figure this out. The scientists say, well, wait a minute, you're biologically, your DNA tells you exactly who you are. I mean, it would be like me just saying, okay, I want you to go out there and jump, and jump in, in my Ford. And you say, well, no, you have a Chevy. No, I think it's a Ford. Because I think it's a Ford, it must be a Ford. No, come on, let's go out there. It is a Chevy. It's a Traverse. Come on, look at it. It's labeled all over the car. Wait a second. See, that's the way the confused person in the world who doesn't have the truth, whatever they make up, it's the truth. But for the Christian, when you know Jesus, you know the truth because he has revealed the truth in his word. That's why we study the Bible around here. It is the word of Christ. Jesus said to the Father, he said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. I find this. 75 times, over 75 times, Jesus says in the, in the Bible, I tell you the truth. You see, because he is the truth, everything he says is true. Everything. It isn't true that like truth is out there and he measures up to the standard. No, he is the standard. You have to measure up to him. And if you don't have him in your life, you don't have the truth. You don't see anything correctly. You put the wrong interpretation on everything. But when he's in your life, the truth is in you. And you dig into the truth. You see the world through his wonderful eyes. And you see the truth. Here's what happens. Jesus said, so when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. That's proof. He's been predicting it, that he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die. He said, and when you see it happen, you're going to know that I am who I said that I am. I am the way. Listen, to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, now if you hold to my teachings, that means you've got to be in the Word of God. If you hold to my teaching." You are really my disciples, and watch this. When you are his disciple, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. By golly, you'll know that you're a man if you're a man, and you'll know that you're a woman if you're a woman. You'll know that these are God-created apples and not evolved. You're going you're gonna to know the, the truth will set you free from the path of the slavery of the lies because you will embrace the truth because he is the truth and the truth is in you. Is this powerful or what? You have to have Jesus to know the truth. Jesus saw himself as the way, the truth, and the life. He saw himself as the life. As the life. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been sick? I'll bet every single person here has been sick. And at those moments you say, oh my goodness, you ever been so sick? You say, I'd just like to die. 
I mean, really ill, really, really ill. And you just said, oh, my goodness, death would be better than this. So let me ask you this question. How about it? How many of you have been dead? Well, you look around and say, well, I don't, don't, don't know. No, I think I'm alive. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, to the readers that he's writing to, who are living people, he said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He's talking about spiritually. They were spiritually dead. Now, th- let me ask you, what does a dead person do? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. So these people say, you know, you know, my good, when I get to heaven, I'm going to stand before God, and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? And I'm going to say, well, look at all these good things I've done. He's going to say, uh, dead people don't do good things. Dead people are dead. If you don't know Jesus Christ, who is the life, you are dead. There's not a thing you can do to make you come alive. In fact, the passage goes on and says, God has made us alive in Christ Jesus and seated us in heavenly places. Then it wraps up, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, because dead people can't do works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus has divine life divine life. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, capital letter, on Word, because this is the eternal Lagos, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, before He was born, in the flesh, He was called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word with there is face-to-face kind of with. In the very presence of the Father, is the Son and the Father, and His Holy Spirit as well. But he's focused on the word here, and he says, and the word was God. He's equal with God in every single way. He was with God in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, Jesus was there as the word. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. All creation took place by the handiwork of Jesus himself. The Father planned that the Son executed and the Holy Spirit, it says, hovered over the face of it and generated it all. All of Godhead was involved in creation. Jesus here is the divine, deity, godly, God word who creates everything. Without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing was made without Jesus Christ. And then he says, in him was life. And we're talking about divine life. He's got life. And then he adds this. And the light, that light, that light was the light of men that lights everyone. Anybody who is alive has been touched by God, Jesus Christ. If you have life in you, you're alive physically. But more importantly, you need that light of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ illuminating your spiritual life so that you can see you're a dead, blind sinner And the moment you accept Christ as your Savior, he imparts into you a life. And that life is a light. That light shines in darkness. And the darkness doesn't overpower it. It can't understand it. I, I love this passage. I am the light, and my light will expel the darkness. Darkness can never overtake my light. Do it. You conduct this experiment at home. You close, turn out the lights, everything in the room, close your closet door so there's no light getting in it, turn the light back on in the room, and then quick, open the door, and watch. The darkness doesn't put out your light, your light puts out the darkness. God's life in me is to put out the darkness. I should not be living in darkness. I should be living in the light because he is life, and his life, it, it dispels all darkness. He's got divine life, and he's got eternal life in him. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior as an eight-year-old boy, he infused in me eternal life, and this is the life in his Son. He says, I write these things, and verse is down below. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's me. I believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 
So you notice it didn't say that you might hope so, think so, feel like, but that you may know. I ask people all the time, have you come to the place in your life where you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven to be with God forever? And I get this response all the time, I don't know. Well, if you're not sure, you don't know that you're sure, then you don't know at all. Even though this Bible verse is telling us that you can know for sure you have eternal life. Where is eternal life? Oh, it's in Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> if you have the Son, you have eternal life. And, and I know we think of that as a future eternal life in the place that the Father is prepared in heaven. But he also said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. You know, the people on that broad road that leads to destruction, they think they're really living. And they're so lost and so deceived. Those on the narrow road, their life is so different. Over here, they, they don't have God and they don't know the truth. They're, they're embracing life. And the people on that narrow road that leads to, you know, to, uh, to life, they're the ones who have life to the full. Because at the end, they have eternal life. While those on the broad road, they're going to destruction. But those on the narrow road, leads to eternal life. But it's not just later life. Listen, we who are on the narrow road, the way, Jesus Christ is the way, we are the ones who are loved. God so loved the world. He loves me. I've been graced. That means God has given me what I don't deserve. I deserve that same destruction that the people on the the broad road around, but instead he has given me life. He has graced me, given me what I don't deserve. He has saved me. He's pulled me out of my sin, and he's placed me in, in his own family. Listen, I'm a new creature, and if anyone is in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. My life has radically changed. For some reason, I, I lose my friends on the broad road because I'm on the narrow road, and I have a whole new life and those two lives just don't match and pretty soon. I don't try to lose those friends. They lose me because I'm on a new road. I'm on a new path in my life. I'm forgiven. I'm released of all, all the, the guilt of all my sins. He says, I'm justified. Not as God just released me, but he's to pronounce me as the judge of the universe that I am righteous in Jesus Christ. I will never, ever come under the wrath of God. Ever, ever, ever. I'm sanctified. He set me apart and made me holy. You know, from time to time, I tell you, we've got holy dishes at home. They say, you do? Yeah, they're called fine china. Fine china is like a holy dish. It's set apart from all the rest. You set it apart, and you only use it on very special occasions for very special purposes. That's sanctification. Sanctification means God has set you apart. He set you apart and put you on the narrow path because you're not just common going to destruction. Now, I also have some uh, common, ordinary junk plates. We call them paper plates. And when we get done using them, we throw them in the trash. We don't wash them. Oh, but those holy plates, okay, those sanctified plates, that china, man, we don't even put it in the dishwasher because it might tarnish the silver on the edges when it sits on the rack. You hand what you're very curious with them. You don't want to drop them. That's what we are. We are God's fine china. He's, we're sanctified. Is it getting any better than that? Oh, yeah, I'm chosen of the Lord. The Bible tells me it wasn't simply that I picked him. He first picked me. God, God picked me to be on his team. I remember as a kid, we used to flip the bat in order to find out who's going to get first pick. You know, you flip the bat and the kid catch it, and the next kid put his hand on it all the way up to the top, and the guy that was at the top, you know, he got first pick, and then... You could put the, we call it a, a, an eagle, you grab it by the very top, you hold it like that, and then the other kid gets an opportunity to kick it. If he can kick it out of your hand, then he gets first pick. God didn't play it that way. God chose you. That's it. He chose you. He chose you. And he chose you and put you in his family. This is all, I'm in the family of God right now. I've been chosen. I'm in the family of God. I am an heir of everything that is Jesus Christ. I have been reconciled. God is no longer angry with me. I am at peace with God. Hey, it, can it get any better than this? Oh, my God. Yes, it can. I'm accepted by God. I'm eternally alive. I'm called a friend of God. Don't buy the lie 
that because you've blown it some way in your life that God is out to get you? He may discipline you like you would your own child because you want to correct them for their best, but God is not out to get you. You're a friend of God. You should have hope. He gives us hope. He is our hope. It's called the blessed hope. My body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit, so I treat my body differently. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in me, God the Son, and by faith dwells in me. I am indwelt by God. I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. In the ancient world, they put a seal on a document. It represented ownership, protection, and that it belonged to whoever that seal represented. God set his seal of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I belong to God. He knows it. I am protected by God under his authority. Man, this is great. This is me now. Not just some future time. This is now. This is really living. I'm filled. I got that cup in the background. It's just overflowing. It's not that I need more of the Holy Spirit. I got all the Holy Spirit I'll ever get. The concept of filling is to allow the Holy Spirit to invade every area of your life. You ever drive down the road and see the motel and it's got a vacancy sign? It'll have no vacancy. What's that mean? It means it's full. Now, let me ask, could you cram another person in one of those rooms? Of course you could. What it means is every single one of the rooms is occupied, so it is full. That's the concept of being filled with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit wants to occupy every spirit of your life, every room of your life right now, your work life, your family life, your friendship life, your social life, your church life. He wants to be in control of every one of them. And when you allow him access to every area of your life, you're filled with the Spirit of God. That's now. That's now. This is the abundant life now. God is filling my life. I'm an ambassador. I represent Jesus Christ. I am heaven bound. When I do die, I'm going to heaven. And I know this because I've read the end of the book. I'm the winner. We win. Jesus Christ returns, takes me to heaven. Oh, I'm with him forever and ever. I'm the winner. Listen. This is all stuff right now. Who doesn't want all that? All those people on the broad road thinking they've got the life. They're deceived. They don't have the truth. They're going the wrong way. But those who have Jesus Christ have all this right now. What I want to suggest is that you take him with you today. I don't know if you know him or not, but you need to take him with you today. Those who are watching online, you need to take Jesus with you today. The Bible tells us he came to that which was his own. He came to the Jewish people. But his own did not receive him. They rejected him. We'll see that in the coming weeks. Crucify him, crucify him. We'll not have this man to reign over us. Yet to all who received him, then he wants to tell you what it means to receive him. This is called a gloss. He defines what it means to receive him. It's a glossary. It's right in the text. He says, this is what it means to receive him. To those who believe in his name. You've got to become a believer in Jesus Christ. If you believe in him, he has given you the right to become the child of God. You're in God's family. Boom. I got it right now. I got it right now. In the book of Revelation, there's this verse. It says that the Lord is outside knocking on the door. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. I'm pounding away. If anyone hears my voice, and not, only, not only is he knocking, but he's calling. He's calling. Now, when I was a kid, we used to go down to the neighbor's house, and we didn't knock on the door and ask the kid to come out to play. We'd just stand there, and we'd yell. And it, one, Victor was down the street. His name was Victor Getfi. I'd stand, oh, Victor! And he'd have this, you know, we'd yell, and, and uh, he'd come to the door. No, my mom won't let me come out and play. Or, yeah, I can come out and play. Listen, Jesus is knocking on your heart's door, and he's calling you by name saying, open the door, let me into your life. He says, if you will open the door, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, he will invade you. And notice what it says, and he will eat with him and he with me. We call that fellowship. When we have fellowship here, there's, it seems like there's always food. It's always been that way. 
He said, we will have a relationship where we sit down and we sit a spell and we eat and we share. He said, I want to be in your life. And you can invite him in today. So simple to do. I did as just a a child. I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And you can do it even now as an adult. You see, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The rest of it goes like this. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you don't have Jesus, you're not on the right path, you're not on the way, you don't have the truth, and you have no life. But if you have Jesus, you're on the right path, you have the truth, and you have life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know the heart of any man. Only you look down from heaven and don't look on the outward appearance, but you look on the heart. And so you see every heart here today and whether they have placed genuine faith in Jesus Christ. If they are people of the way, people of the truth, embracing Christ in the people of eternal life, to come and abundant life now. I pray, Father, if there's someone here who says, you know, I'm missing all of that. I want it. I hear you knocking today on my heart's door, and I open my heart and say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Save me from my sin. Lord, I know that you will, if they will just pray that to you now, in the silence of this moment, say, Lord, save me a sinner. Give me life eternal, abundant life. Open my eyes to the truth. Put me on the path, the way. Make me a way, people. Lord, I know if they pray that with sincerity in their heart, that you will change them from the inside out as being a member of the family of God. Lord, those of us who have known you, may we just rekindle that fire of all these truths so that I do not let anyone or myself deceive me that I am not a valuable, worthwhile individual, and I know who I am. I am a person of the way, the truth, and the life. Bless us in this hour, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.